Thank you very much. Um, yeah, well, I, I appreciate those comments, and uh, it's getting late in the day, and we've lost quite a bit of our audience. So I think maybe I'll keep my comments short at this point to allow more open discussion. But I just wanted to say a few things. So clearly on education, of course, I agree. Uh, one can't be a professor and not believe in education. And yet I thought your talk was so interesting because you also pointed to some of the complexities about it and the fact that you know the older, more educated people seemed more ignorant or confused. I mean, it's not clear, does that mean that they just had inadequate education back in their day? Or is there some deeper problem? I think that's worth looking at because we see something a little bit similar in the United States where polls show that among Democrats and independents, more education leads to better understanding of environmental issues like climate change. But among Republicans, more education is correlated with a worse understanding of higher <laughs> levels of rejection of scientific evidence. So, well, we already knew there was something wrong with Republican men, but, <laughs> um, but you know, this is something that obviously we need to understand. If you just give more information to people who have already made up their minds against something, it can actually cause them to become even more entrenched in their position. So that's something that I think you know, is worthy of more study so we can better understand what forms of education are effective and what forms are not. Um, clearly, children are more receptive and open-minded than grown-ups, um, but we can't wait for the children to grow up. Um, the green accounting subject is so interesting and so important. I'm so glad you're here to talk about that today. And I think there's so many levels on which that's interesting and important. I'll just mention a couple. Um, on your point about the very small number, I also noticed that, but I had a different reaction. My reaction was, I hope that that's correct, <laughs> because it's actually an extremely important response to one of the negative criticisms that is often made about environmental protection, which is that it's too expensive because it will stand in the way of economic activity and development. But if the data you showed are correct, then those data show that environmental degradation, like cutting down trees, really only adds a very small amount to economic activity. And therefore, we can protect those forests, we can protect the fish, we can do many things to protect the natural environment, and it would appear, from the data you have, that the cost to total GDP is actually very modest. And so that strikes me as actually a very powerful way, in a way to fight back you know, on their own terms, right? It's a bit like my colleague Richard Carson, who maybe you know, is one of the people who in the United States pioneered the idea of um, putting an economic value on non-economic goods like beauty, uh, youth sheds, peace and quiet. And when he first did that work, he was criticized by many of his left-wing environmental colleagues who thought that it was morally offensive to put a dollar value figure you know, on a beautiful view or the quiet in a national park. But his argument was, well, but by doing that, you can actually show that these goods have very, very significant value. You can translate it into the terms that are commensurate with the kind of classical economic analysis and use that to push back. And it's a controversial argument. Not everyone agrees with it even today. But it's certainly an argument that I think is very important to take seriously. Um, at the same time, I also thought your point about damages is really crucial. So there's more than one way to look at the economic issues. So one is, how much does environmental segregation add to economic activity? But then another is, how much does damage remove from productive economic activity? In the United States, there's been a lot of talk just in the last few weeks about the damages from Hurricane Sandy. And the fact that people are estimating those damages at $62 billion, uh, which is now looking like possibly being the worst natural disaster in U.S. history, worse than Hurricane Katrina, is for a lot of people a wake-up call to, to show, I mean, this gets back to the whole ounce of prevention, pound of cure problem. I mean, if that one hurricane alone did $62 billion of damage, you know, that's hard not to take seriously. And so for many people who might worry about the cost of environmental protection, being able to point out the cost of environmental damage um, can be a very, very important and powerful tool. And that's an important and powerful tool that speaks to people who might not otherwise be concerned about environmental protection. So it becomes a way to expand the audience 
for the conversation by talking about financial damage, and particularly damage to infrastructure, because we know that when we build infrastructure, I mean, one of the big problems with all economic analyses is what a short-term horizon many businesses have. I know I, I, um, I don't know if, how many of you are familiar with Francois Germain in Paris, who's done work on uh, impacts and adaptation to climate change. He has a very interesting study in the Maldives where they spoke to hotel developers and asked them, well, how can you build a new hotel? How can you invest 50 or 100 million dollars in a hotel which will be destroyed by sea level rise maybe within 30 years? And their answer was, we don't care about 30 years. Our planning horizon for a hotel is 5 to 10, maybe 15. After 15 years, the hotel needs to be renovated anyway. So that's problematic. But when you build a bridge, or you build a subway system, you build a tunnel, you don't expect that bridge just to last for 15 years. You expect that bridge to last for 100 years. The subway tunnels in New York City that were flooded in Superstorm Sandy most of those were built more than 100 years ago. So that's very, very important because if we're talking about climate change impacts that will unfold over the course of 10, 50, 100 years, then damage to infrastructure is very, very important. So I think the idea of having an annual report on damages is really great. It's a great idea, and I hope we can do more to promote that concept. I also think it's important in terms of the question that we haven't really talked about today, but I think we'll talk about more tomorrow about what can small countries do. Small countries can be models, and models can then be transferred. And if, for a variety of political reasons, we've had trouble in the United States pushing forward environmental accounting, well, if a country like Taiwan, which is highly respected in the United States, models what this can look like and begins to talk about it more broadly in the international community, that can become a model that people like me can use when I go home and speak about what we could be doing. One thing that's been very helpful for me this past year is the Canadian province of British Columbia. Does anybody know why British Columbia is so helpful? They have a carbon tax. <laughs> <laughs> and it has not wrecked their climate. And it's very, very good for me because if, if Sweden had a carbon tax, a lot of Americans would say, well, we know they're socialists in Sweden. <laughs> <laughs> but Nobody thinks British Columbia is socialistic. In fact, British Columbia has a very resource-intensive economy, a big mining industry, big stock mining exchange in Vancouver. Um, it's a place that a lot of Americans have visited to go skiing at Whistler. They know about Vancouver because of the Olympics. So it's familiar. It's friendly. Americans think of Canadians as being like us, um, although they do have socialized medicine. But you know, <laughs> but in general, so the fact that British Columbia has implemented a carbon tax, and even better, it was implemented by a conservative government who paid attention to the advice of their economists. And they made some exceptions for the cement industry. You know, they really worked with industry. So it's a very helpful example. British Columbia is a very small place, a very small population. The whole population of Canada is only 15 million people. British Columbia, I've forgotten, but it's two million, something like that. Small country, small province, small place, but it's still a very useful model because you can show that it works on a small scale and therefore you have the possibility to expand it to a larger scale. I just wanted to say something about the carbon capture and use. That's a, also a great example um, because carbon capture and storage for most people I've spoken to sounds like something that costs a lot of money and doesn't necessarily generate a lot of economic benefit, maybe some jobs. But if you can actually capture the carbon and use it and make productive materials, for a lot of people that is a more attractive proposition. Plus, it's a more attractive proposition for me as a geologist who worries about what happens when you pump large amounts of fluid into the subsurface, because we know that that can trigger earthquakes. Uh, and also because... From a geological standpoint, carbon capture and storage raises the question of whether or not the carbon is truly stored or whether it migrates back to the surface in the fullness of time. But if you use the carbon and convert it to methanol that you burn or something else, then you have a better sense of where that carbon ends up in the long run. So that's very, very attractive in many ways. So I'd like to know a lot more about how that came about. Um, you know, did the company do it because they thought they could make a profit? Did 
they do it because their permits depended on it? Was it some kind of deal with the government? Was there a regulatory structure that encouraged it? Um, you know, one could imagine a punitive taxation system, a carbon tax that would apply to any carbon emissions that could create a, an incentive for capturing and using garbage. So I think those kinds of questions about what are the specific conditions that made that model attractive and feasible in that case, and again, are those conditions scalable, generalizable? What can we learn from that example that could be applied to other industrial settings? So I think that's sufficient, and I'll pass it on. Thank you. Uh, so, so uh, thank you very much. Uh, now I think uh, we.